the Bhagavad Gita 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 Bhagav
is very flavorless and, and terrible smell. Um, so you get these rancid, unclean, off flavors in, in milk, uh, and and also in in the uh, the products butter and cheese. One real problem with it is that it causes a reduction in foaming capacity, uh, which is not good for making cappuccino coffee. And I guess a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, companies have had issues with um, uh, their, their milk not not foaming. Now it can happen on the farm, um, and I guess most of the lipolysis we get in milk does happen on the farm, especially in cows in late lactation and on and from cows in poor on poor quality feed. So if you get a combination of those two, then you it's a double whammy, and, and you certainly get some lipolysis. Um, it can happen in the factory as well. So um, if we pump or agitate milk, particularly if you get foaming, the foaming tends to break up the milk back globule and allow the, the lipase to, uh, to attack the fat. So it's, uh, uh, it's necessary to be quite careful with the way we, we handle uh, milk, particularly raw milk. Now another type of acidity that we get in milk is, is what's called titratable acidity and that's uh, of course related to pH. Um, the acidity increases um, and correspondingly the pH decreases when we get um, bugs growing in the milk. So if we get a high level of, um, of growth of bacteria, we get quite a lot of um, uh, lactic acid being formed. Um, the normal titratable acidity is around about 0.1, 0.12 lactic acid and the normal pH is about 6.7. So um, if we if if the milk is uh, much out of that, uh, those ranges, then we get a little bit suspicious. Now, I've put one in here that you might not have expected, and I guess it's, um, it's, it more applies to uh, pasteurised milk, not so much to raw milk, because raw milk is very seldom exposed to very much light. But uh, I put this in because there's been a few inquiries lately about um, from companies saying, what are the effects of light on the milk, if, if, I, if I pack in a, uh, a clear plastic bottle, will that really have much effect? Well, it does have quite a lot of an effect, and um, some of you might have um, tasted the milk that's been exposed to the to the light, uh, sunlight, or or even um, or particularly um, fluorescent light. Um, one of the uh, things that I came across was this example that I've got got in there, uh, where people looked at flavour defects in, in pasteurised milk in, in clear plastic bottles that were stored in one of these um, uh, re retail refrigerated um, cabinets at 6 degrees under fluorescent light. And um, trained tasters could taste the, the difference in 15 to 30 minutes and even untrained consumers um, in, within two hours. So you can see that there's, uh, there's no way that you really want to pack uh, milk in a, in a plastic bottle um, and leave it in the in the uh, display cabinet for too long. And I just put in there that it's been estimated that something like 50% of the milk remains in the display cabinets uh, for greater than eight hours. So if it's uh, if it's not protected during that time, then uh, uh, it, it's going to go. Uh, uh, it's going to get an awful flavour. Uh, so that's why we have opaque and, and coloured uh, plastic bottles and sleeves on bottles. A lot of the the uh, flavoured milks now got got sleeves on them, and of course the, the paper cartons. Um, some of those have got an aluminium layer, which is a, a very good uh, light protection barrier. So, what about standards for raw milk? Well, a lot of these are set by companies, not necessarily um, uh, by regulations in, in Australia. And this is an example, a sort of example that. Um, uh, a company might set fat needs to be greater than 3.2. These are sort of minimum levels, um, and, and most companies will have a target level as well that they um, that they aim for. Um, protein 3.2, acidity less than 0.16, and that, again they'd like it to be down around 0.12 or something like that. And fat greater than 6.6, and I guess they'd like it to be 6.7 or something like that. Um, Freezing point, uh, one I haven't mentioned, but um, this is the, the hardy perennial, I suppose, that um, was introduced to, to pick up added water in milk. Um, it's quite sensitive, uh, 
most uh, freezing points should be around about minus um, degrees hot theft. That's the way it's measured. That's a little bit different from, from Celsius. Um, the international limit is something like um, 525. Now, if you've got a, a milk 540 and you add around about 2% water, you'll actually get to around about uh, 0.525. So um, most companies would like to have a, um, a bit better um, standard than that. I just thought I'd put in the Chinese standard for, for raw milk, just to give an indication, because a lot of people now are um, thinking of or are already exporting uh, milk to uh, to China. I've, I've got another slide about the pasteurised milk, but I thought this was interesting. A lot of a lot of countries now don't specify very much in terms of standards for raw milk, so I thought this one was interesting. Their freezing point minus 500 to the minus 560. This is in Celsius, so that's a little bit lower than the, the hot bed, but it's a it's a very big range that they've got there. Specific gravity. I haven't talked about that, and it's usually not used in this country as a as a uh, specification. Protein 2.8, so quite a bit lower than um, what we'd normally expect here. And fat 3.1, similar to what we our lower limit here. They do an impurity, which is um, bits of dirt and stuff that um, uh, that they get if they if they filter them milk or when they filter them. Uh, milk size not fat, but 8.1, that's um, a little bit lower than most of their milk here. And then in their acidity, uh, they go 12 to 18 for, for bovine milk. Uh, and this is in degrees um, Fahrenheit, which is a bit different from degrees Celsius. Um, you actually have to multiply your, uh, sorry, not degrees Celsius, percent lactic acid. You have to, have to multiply your percent lactic acid by something like 111 to get to degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so 12 to 18 is equivalent to something like um, uh, 10 to 16 or something like that. Okay, let's talk about somatic cells and, and just what, what they mean. Um, somatic cells is just really just means body cells. They're mostly white blood cells. Um, technically they're called polymorphonuclear leukocytes or neutrophils. But in, in the blood they're really called neutrophils. This is, this is a, a blood neutrophil here. The ones in, um, in milk look like that, although not quite, not quite as, um, as clean looking as that. The, um, so they're, they're really, I suppose if I can say, pus cells. They're, they're there in, in, um, as a reaction to infection. And the infections are used by streptococci, staphylococci, and on occasions even coliforms. Um, you do also get a few cells being shed from the inside of the mammary gland, the, the other, uh, during the infection. So that thing, that uh, adds to the somatic cells. They're, they're quite large um, cells compared with bacteria, seven to fifteen microns. So they're they're um, they're much bigger than um, just about any um, bacterial cell. So we we, um, we talk about the problems associated with milk in terms of the of the um, somatic cell count or or the bulk somatic cell count. I guess the bulk somatic cell count just means when we commingle all the milk together. Um, and just to give some indication of the levels, less than 150,000 per mil is excellent. 150,000 to 250,000 is good. And some companies set um, levels of 250 or 200 um, uh, for premium payments. 50 to 400, moderate, and um, there's obviously some cell count control by the by the farmers to get to that level. 400 is really the the limit that's been set, upper limit that's been set in Australia and New Zealand, and the EU and Canada. Uh, and the EU maintained that greater than 400,000 is not fit for human consumption. But interestingly enough, the legal limit for A grade milk in the US is 750,000. If you go to Brazil, it's a million, so um, it's good enough for, for some people to have higher than, than 400. So why are we really concerned about somatic cells? Um, when we arise, we, we basically um, kill any activity in them. Uh, so why do, we, why do we worry about them? Well, if you're a farmer, you, you'll be worried because you lose a lot of milk, you lose a lot of uh, money through reduced production. Uh, and of course, it costs you money for, for treatment um, with antibiotics. 
and there's the inconvenience of to keep the milk separate from the bulk supply. Um, milk with uh, a high somatic cell count has quite a changed composition. It has less protein and whey proteins, less casein and whey proteins, more milk protein, reduced lactose, higher salt levels, and using increased pH to the seven. So you can see that it's not going to be ideal for a, a lot of lot of product. Um, the um, the bacteria causing the mastitis, which um, a lot of them are pathogenic, obviously, they they add to the bacterial load, but Fortunately, they're destroyed by pasteurisation. So they lead to reduced quality in, our, in products made from milk with um, high counts, particularly those above 250,000. And obviously, the higher the number of count, number of um, cells, the, the worse the quality of the milk. The snake cells also contain uh, enzymes, which can break down you know, proteins and fats. Uh, the proteases that uh, are quite stable and they can um, stay in products like UHT milk and cause bitterness and gelation during storage. So, so they're, they're not good. So the higher the cell count, the shorter the time for the appearance of bitter flavour and gelation in UHT milk. And as I said before, mast mastitic milk has a, free, a higher uh, free fatty acid level. That's, that's due to the lipases, but it's also due to incomplete synthesis of the triglycerides because you've, the, the bacterial infection really interferes with uh, the metabolic processes within the mammary gland. So mastitic milk is pretty significant in, in cheese making. Um, it reduces the cheese yield um, and that's largely through the plasmin which degrades the protein so you lose more protein in the whey. Um, the reduced casein obviously directly affects your cheese yield and the curd formation is, is not as good. You get um, it's longer for the flocculation, uh, slower rate of curd firming and um, reduced firmness so, and, and you get more loss of fines uh, in, in the way. So obviously that's um, <clears throat> not exactly what a cheese maker wants and of course once you've made the cheese you've got um, a reduction in quality as well, uh, decrease, decrease curd strength. Um, due to the high whey proteins, low caseins, uh, pH and altered um, uh, calcium phosphate caseinate ba uh, balance. Um, it has a higher moisture content, um, it's soft, less elastic, sticky and grainy So, uh, and the flavour might be um, off as well. So all in all not a good idea to use uh, mastitic milk but of course as I mentioned before it really depends on the, on the number of cells that you've got there. Um, you know, less than 250,000 is probably not going to make much difference, but once you start getting over 400, it probably does make a difference. Okay, let's have a look at bacteria. And as I said, uh, these are the, probably the, the, uh, the focus of the presentation today. I've, I say they're bacteria and their enzymes because uh, that's really all bacteria do is produce enzymes which then cause problems. So the bacteria themselves are not a problem. It's a bacteria that the enzymes that they produce that are the problem. So all milk contain all raw milk contains bacteria, uh, so we can't get away from it. The bacteria are less than one micron in diameter and two to eight microns long, the the, the rod shaped ones. So um, as you see, a lot smaller than the somatic cells. They come in different shapes and, and obviously sizes. Some are spherical, some are rod shaped. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this is the only reason why we heat treat milk. If we didn't have bacteria, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need to heat treat milk. Um, so the dairy industry might not even exist, as a, certainly not as, as it is at the moment. Um, so knowledge of milk caused by the enzymes that they produce. And the, the bacteria come from various places. Um, they come from the gal initially, uh, the udder and the teat services. Obviously, if we've got mastitis, uh, we're going to get some um, some material from them. The environment, the air, the water, the soil, dust, mud, uh, manure, anything that's on the on the teat surface that could get into the milk will will be there. Uh, and equipment, uh, of course, if we don't train the equipment properly, that's going to keep on recontaminating our product. And humans, we we all 
add to the, the amount of uh, bacteria just by, by being around it and handling the products. Now, this is probably second nature to, to many of you, but very quickly, when we talk about growth of bacteria, we're not talking about the size of a, of a bacterium, we're talking about uh, the growth through cell division. So one cell becomes two, and of course two become four, four become eight, eight becomes 16. So that's how cells, cells grow. Now, there are a lot of different types of bacteria. I just want to talk about a few. Obviously, spoilage and pathogenic are two that we, we talk about very often. Our, uh, the spoilage bacteria, they are the ones that make the milk go off, spoil the milk. The pathogens, of course, are the ones that cause disease, and, and they're the ones that we use pasteurization to, to kill. Pasteurization has been set up specifically to kill the most heat-resistant heat um, uh, pathogen, which is a, a coxiella. The Q fever organism. Sometimes uh, milk is thermized um, at a much lower temperature, 65 to 15 seconds, say. Kills most of our spoilage bacteria and just gives us a bit more time before we use the raw milk for, for processing. Um, it doesn't kill all the, the pathogens, so it's not, a, it's not a true pasteurization process. Another major type of the spore forming, as opposed to the non spore forming, now, now most of the milk in raw milk don't form spores, so I guess they're non-spore forming. Uh, so things like Pseudomonas that um, we hear about very readily, they're, they're non-spore forming. A spore is um, a dormant, dormant state of the, of the bacterium and, and they only grow and, and they, uh, they tend to form when the, the conditions are unfavourable for them to grow. Uh, and I'll put this little diagram here which I've pinched off the net. Uh, just showing you how the vegetative cell turns into a spore, eventually it um, forms a spore which eventually becomes a free spore. That free spore is a, a little hard spherical object, very, very dry and that's why it's uh, very uh, heat resistant. It's uh, not affected by pasteurization. Most of them are killed by UHT but even not all of them then. And um, when conditions are favourable again, the spores can then turn into vegetative cells and keep growing, i.e. multiply. A couple more types of um, bacteria, thermogerics, those are the ones that are not killed by pasteurisation. These include the spores, but not only the not only spores, things like Peroni bacteria, even things like Streptococcus, Streptococcus thermophilus, um, they're quite resistant to pasteurisation. Now we also talk about mesophiles and psychotrophs and thermophiles. This, so these are classed according to what temperatures they grow at. The mesophiles are probably the most abundant and they're the ones that grow around room temperature. Psychotrophs are the ones that we're most concerned about in milk because they will grow at low temperatures. They mightn't prefer to grow there, but they do grow there. A lot of them prefer to grow at room temperature, but they're quite happy to grow at 7 degrees. And then we've got our thermophiles, which will only grow above about 50 or maybe a bit lower than that, but um, they're not really an issue unless we really abuse our milk. Um, and they're only really a problem in, um, in UHT milk that, um, that might be sitting out on the, on the tarmac um, uh, in Dubai or somewhere like that. Um, and then there's the lactic acid bacteria, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but they're obviously very important from uh, for cheese making and yogurt making, they're the major bacteria in the raw milk as it comes from the other. Um, but they don't like growing at low temperatures, so uh, they don't um, they don't grow once we refrigerate the milk. Now a little bit about bacterial counts. Um, there are several types of bacterial counts, and most of you most of you will be familiar with total plate, plate counts. Sometimes they're called APC aerobic plate counts. Sometimes SPC standard plant count. They all, they all mean up the same. Um, and then there's a psychotroph count, which only measures the ones that grow at low temperature. Thermogenic count, or sometimes LPC, laboratory pasteurised count. So you heat the milk and, and then see which ones are still there and survive. Spore count, uh, we can do spore counts with the vegetative cells and just keep the spores and, and um, see how many of those we've got. And that's sometimes done particularly for uh, UHT milk. Coliforms and E. coli, um, pretty much standard in, in most testing because of their 
their pathogenic nature um, and their relationship to, uh, I guess, faecal contamination in milk. Same with Salmonella, uh, Listeria, Staphylococci. These are, are fairly standard uh, pathogenic tests that are, that are done for, uh, for, for many milks. Yeast and moles uh, is, is another one that's done pretty routinely. Now, I just wanted to, to go through a few slides here, just how, how bacterial count is measured. Um, uh, a lot of us just accept that the, the count is such and such, well, what's it really mean? Um, these days, it's pretty much done by a machine like a vector scan, and I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later on. But in terms of a manual count, um, just a brief outline here of a, a manual count. We usually dilute our milk, maybe say one in a hundred, and we put a small amount, maybe 0.1 of a mil, onto some sort of nutritious agar in a, in a petri dish or plate. Um, that's the, the same thing. Uh, the plates are incubated for usually 30 degrees for two to three days uh, to allow the bacterial cells to grow. <coughs> when they grow, they actually form colonies which, which look like little beads. And I'll put this, uh, uh, this plate here, which again I pinched off the net. Um, uh, you'll see that they all look very similar. Um, that's not the case with um, uh, ones from milk. These are obviously pure cultures. So uh, then we count the number of cells on there. I counted these and they come to about 95. So that's where we start in terms of making a, a cell count. We can work out our, our true total plate count from that. If we've got 95 colonies on the plate, that's 950 per mil because we only use 0.1 of a mil. Uh, we diluted it a hundred times, therefore multiply by a hundred again, and we get 95,000 comet forming units per mil. So um, 9.5 by 10 to the 4 is why it's often and, um, stated. Now, a good milk should have um, something like a thousand to 10,000 CFU per mil. Poor quality greater than a hundred thousand. Very poor quality greater than a million. And spoiled milk is generally round about the the 10 million, you can even spoil it um, at, uh, at a million. So there's a few counts other than um, total plate count and um, things like uh, thermogenics, we do a heat treatment before we do those. Uh, colour forms, they, they need a special microbiological medium and uh, special incubation conditions. So if we do psychotroph counts, we need to incubate at seven degrees. So, so all that are slightly different, just a, a bit of a variation on the the total plate count, but the, the principles are, are much the same. So just um, a couple of slides on the non-manual methods, and I guess um, the Bacter scan is probably the most common one. There are quite a few of these um, rapid instrumental methods around, um, and they are obviously ideal for factories um, and um, laboratories doing counts on, um, on farm milks. This, uh, the Bacter scan, is based on flow cytometry, so you have a flow of, of milk through here, um, and the components of the all components of the milk, apart from the cells, are the bacterial cells, are broken down or made soluble, and then we stain the bacterial cells with a fluorescent dye, um, something like aphidium bromide, and then we count the individuals or the, the machine counts the individual cells as they pass through the capillary tube. So this is a milk coming up through the capillary tube. Um, it's been, the, the cells have been stained with the fluorescent stain. Uh, we have a, a light source here which is directed uh, at the cells as they pass through this, this capillary. And this is our collector here, the, the fluorescent uh, uh, rays pass into this, uh, this collector here and are, and are counted. So it counts every, every cell, uh, which is not exactly what um, uh, the, the, the total plate count um, uh, methods do, because uh, sometimes we get clumping of cells. If you get a clump of cells, they come out as one colony on a plate. So, so in general, the counts are going to be higher with a Bacter scan than they are um, for a, a total plate count. So the Bacter scan can measure up to something like 200 samples an hour, which is uh, uh, which is ideal for for the high throughput through that's needed. So what about the good and the bad and the ugly counts? Well, if we take the standard plate count, this is where our good 
our warning and our action needed are. Uh, this is a laboratory pasteurised count. Again, we'd, we'd like it to be down around here, with, around about the, the, the 100. Um, actually, often um, this is mainly spores, so we, we expect to, to be in this region. You can't get rid of the spores, so they're always going to be there. But if you've got a lot of dirty, dirty equipment, that's also going to show up uh, in this area as well. Coliforms, we'd like them to be down around less than, less than 50. And somatic cell counts, of course, we've talked about before. So my summation of a good milk, standard plate count less than 10,000. Thermogeric count less than 200,000. Coliforms less than 50. Somatic cell count less than 200. And spores less than 100. Now, people will argue one way or another about those, but if you had a milk like that, um, there's not many things that you couldn't do with it. It's uh, maybe a good milk. A few microbiological standards for raw milk um, in various parts of the world. The USA, 100,000 um, for individual farm milk. And once you've commingled the milks, uh, 300,000. UK is 100,000. And see in China, 2 million. Um, obviously, that their, their dairy industry is still in its infancy, and I'm sure that um, that standard will be modified um, uh, the longer the uh, industry is in existence. Why do we worry about high cell counts? Um, I guess we know why we worry about high uh, pathogen counts like colis and, um, and salmonella. Uh, they can cause illness and uh, of course they can result in product recalls which um, no, com no company wants. The problems with the, um, the spoilage bacteria are a bit less obvious. If they're really high, the milk's going to be pretty awful. Um, if it's high but not spoiled, it may contain uh, enzymes, these are the proteases and lipases, uh, which are formed by the bacteria. Now, the enzymes tend to form when the total count is greater than about 100,000, so we were likely to get some uh, protease and lipase produced uh, at those high counts. The, the problem with these is that most of them have pretty high heat stability, so if we make ESL milk, which is um, uh, produced at maybe 130 degrees for a few seconds, um, or UHT, which is uh, produced at more like 140 for a few seconds, um, some of these bacteria, some of, the, some of these enzymes still remain and can cause problems during storage of those, uh, uh, those milks. And they can also cause problems in um, uh, cheese. Um, I know there's been um, whole batches of cheese dumped because um, these enzymes have uh, produced bitterness in the cheese after um, bitterness or, or, um, or lipolysis of Ransuzi in the milk after they've been stored for some time. So it's not a small issue. Uh, <clears throat> now, what about the quality of um, pasteurised and, and ESL milks? Um, we don't worry about somatic cells any longer, basically because they're, um, they've been pretty much destroyed. They're still there, of course, but in a dead form. Uh, there are processes around for removing them, like microfiltration, but uh, that's not practiced uh, for, past for uh, market milk in Australia. The bacteria are still a problem, of course. Um, there shouldn't be any pathogenic bacteria there, and if they are there, they're getting in after the heat treatment, and that's, um, that's a very um, uh, serious one. Um, cleanliness of, the, of all the um, equipment down stream of the pasteuriser, including the filling machine, is most important for reducing the amount of what we call post-process contamination. And that's where uh, virtually all of our spoilage comes from in pasteurised milk, is contamination of the milk after it's been heat treated. Uh, we know that if we take the uh, pasteurised milk straight from the pasteuriser without going through a filler, and we, we, um, we package that away aseptically, that milk will keep for several weeks because we haven't given uh, the buds downstream any opportunity to contaminate the milk. So, so there's a real issue with um, post-process contamination. That's the big thing with, that um, affects the quality of, of all of our pasteurised and, and ESL milks. We know that's the case because there are certain 
companies that always have the same bacteria in their milk and that bacteria, those bacteria are coming from their, from their process and not from the raw milk. So uh, it's a big issue. Um, I think it's um, uh, underestimated in terms of the importance of, the, of this post-pasteurisation contamination. If that can be cleaned up, um, pasteurised milk will keep well into the uh, three weeks, uh, etc. Et so I just put up the Chinese standard for pasteurised milk because I know there are companies interested in or are already exporting pasteurised milk to uh, to China. This is their uh, their standard, the total plate count. Now this is what they call a, a three class um, specification. Uh, M is the number of samples that you've got to analyse. C is the number that you're allowed to have over the minimum um, level and under the maximum level. Uh, so 50,000 um, is, is the, is the um, I guess, the specification. Coliform, only one, um, that's um, very low. Uh, you can have up to five in two samples out of five. But things like staph and salmonella, you don't have to have any in 25 mils. So, so that's the, the sort of specification that um, you can expect on on, uh, on pasteurised milk in, in China. Just a little bit about bacteriological quality of, of UHT milks, and some of you will be, be dealing with UHT milk. Um, UHT milk should be what we call commercially sterile. That's, there should be no bacteria left in it that will grow at ambient temperature. Um, so, but how do we tell if it's commercially sterile? And if we've only got one bug in there, that will that, um, it, it will mean that that bug can grow and it's not commercially sterile. But how on earth do you test for, for one one cell in a litre of milk? It's it's very very difficult. Um, the standard method of doing it is to store the milk at 30 degrees for 14 days, and this is basically mandatory for UHT milk. And then we analyse for total plate count. So we, we plate it out and we wait another two or three days for the count. Uh, the count should be zero, but um, uh, most places accept up to 100 uh, per mil. There are different methods available, and um, most um, UHT companies would be using um, ATP based um, methods. The, the ATP uh, in, in living um, uh, uh, cells can be detected from um, the ATP in dead cells, which has been pretty much destroyed. So only the ATP in living bacteria are detected. It's based on bioluminescence, and um, some of you might have seen fireflies in the, in the past. Um, it, we act, they actually use the same principle as, the, as what's used in, in the, how the, the firefly makes its, uh, uh, its, its uh, light. So it's uh, it's a luciferin luciferase, that's the uh, enzyme and substrate that's from fireflies and that produces this bioluminescence which is then measured by various machines and there are, there are quite a few commercial in instruments around and uh, some of you will be, met, be um, uh, familiar with the Celsius or the Pramacol or even the 3M and the Charm machines, There's, there are quite a few around. So just finishing up, what are the factors that affect the quality of our raw milk, which is the basis of what I want to talk about today. On the farm and in the factory, of course, time and temperature, and I'll put that in bold type, um, are the most important things. Uh, keep the milk um, <coughs> for as short a time as possible at, at a lower temperature as possible. Maintenance of equipment, uh, that's so important in terms of the, the, um, uh, the soil that might accumulate on the equipment and then get into the milk and uh, cause the cause high cell counts. And of course cleaning and sanitation practices are all related to that. On the farm of course there are a lot of other issues which affect raw milk quality, some of which um, the farmer has some control over, but um, most of which the, the factory doesn't have much or any control over. So weather conditions, the amount of dust or mud, animal health and husbandry, and this, this is where mastitis and so forth comes in. Inclusion of animal milk, I've mentioned mastitis, mastitic milk and colostrum. Um, and feed, uh, the better the quality feed, the, the, um, the better the, uh, the chemical composition of the milk. And of course, stage of lactation and season can also have an effect.
Uh, just finishing up, uh, raw milk quality is important because if we don't have that right, then our processed milks that we make from it are not going to be right. So, you, as they say, you can't make a silk purse from a sow's ear. So thank you for your attention and um, maybe you'll have um, a few comments. Doug's got one there already, so well, let's see what he's got. Uh, Doug has asked, um, whilst bacterial growth slows or stops at 4 degrees, does the enzyme activity slow as much or continue at a faster rate uh, at those temperatures? Uh, that's, that's a good one, Doug. The, the enzyme activity does keep going. Um, we, we know it does, but uh, at a, at a, um, a much lower uh, rate. So, for example, uh, plasmin, which is a the protease in milk, that can cause uh, bitterness in, in milk, but it can't, it can't act at um, very low temperatures. So if we get bitterness uh, occurring in, 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 uh, in milk, in low temperature stored milk, say ESL milk, that's almost certainly due to, to, um, to bacterial enzymes. So, so yes, it does make a difference. They certainly don't go faster at low temperature, but they, um, uh, they can still all um, uh, Act at, at those low temperatures. Okay, Elaine says, could you please provide more background um, to the International Measurement Unit used for freezing point? Um, Elaine, why don't you um, leave Jenny your um, email address and I'll, I'll send you something on that. There's some nice stuff on the web. I pulled one off last night, so I'll, I'll send you that. Um, Paul says, sorry? Sorry, I just want to say if anyone else wants that information, they're welcome to email me as well and pass it on. Yeah, okay, thanks, Jenny. One of the issues around feeding silage, is it just related to feed quality or are there inherent issues? Some French AOC protocols prohibit feeding silage. Ah, that's that's a good one, Paul. I, I don't uh, profess to be a, an expert on on silage, but one thing I do know is that um, when silage is fed, uh, you're much more likely to get high spore counts in in the milk. Uh, in, in Australia, where we don't house the the, the cattle in, in in winter, our spore our spore counts are really quite low. Uh, if you go to Europe and so forth, where where they house their their cattle a lot and feed them silage, their spore counts are really high. A lot of that's coming coming through from the silage. So so that's one issue. I, I, I don't know what other issues there are in relation to, uh, to feeding silage. Yeah, okay, Doug is, um, Doug's up with this more than I am. He's, he's saying that um, uh, the silage can also can, uh, carry harmful organisms uh, and the EU in particular is concerned about these in, in raw milk cheeses. So, so yeah, thanks for that, Doug. And also, Steve Flint will be addressing that in his webinar in a couple of weeks' time. Ah, yeah. Steve's the expert on spores. Um. Oh, okay. Um, um, about my slide 10, I said about foaming breaking up the milk that goblin membrane. Um, maybe I didn't um, uh, put that in properly. Uh, the foaming, <coughs> if, if a, a fat globule sits alongside, okay, thanks. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> if, if a, a fat bubble sits alongside a, um, a bubble, um, it tends to stretch the, uh, the, the membrane, the milk fat globule, and, and break it, and, and hence um, you get access then um, to the fat by the, the lipase in the, in the milk. So the foaming part is really important. So if you get um, 
if you get pumping without foaming, you don't tend to get um, a lot of um, breakage of the of the um, the fat globule. But if you've got some foaming there, then it makes a big difference.